Hi, everyone. Judge Andrew Napolitano here for Judging Freedom. Today is Thursday, June 9th, 2022. It's about 2.35 or 2.40 in the afternoon on the East Coast of the United States. Uh, our most popular and favorite guest, Scott Ritter, is back. He really needs uh, no introduction to any of you except to remind you that he's the most experienced and courageous person I know with his backgrounds in intelligence and military. Uh, and he is our go-to guy on what is happening in Ukraine and where this um, military adventure is likely to go. Scott, it's always a pleasure. Welcome back, my friend. Thanks for having me. So where do things stand today on uh, June 9th? Uh, Vladimir Putin's plan A, you know, the quick and dirty decapitation of the uh, Zelensky uh, government, obviously that failed. I don't even know a plan B, uh, you know, gather and capture territory by using war crimes. I don't even know if he's still on that. Is he on plan C? Where is he in his own mind today? And where is his military today? Well, the he and his military are on phase two of the special military operation. Phase one, um, according to them, was to shape the battlefield, uh, fix enemy forces in place so that they could, um, you know, better prepare for the uh, decisive battles in the Donbass. Uh, phase one ended around March 25th. You saw a withdrawal of uh, Russian forces from uh, around Kiev in, in the north and a redeployment um, along the Donbass front. And uh, we're seeing the Russia carry out a very deliberate um, uh, attack on uh, very extensive Ukrainian defenses. I think one of the uh, things that has taken me by surprise and, uh, and hopefully, uh, others, I don't know, I can't say hopefully, but I would expect others, is just how extensive the Ukrainian defensive positions were in the Donbass. We're talking they had eight years to dig these things in, reinforce them, um, and they're a tough nut to crack. Uh, Russia's got the appropriate nutcracker, but it's going to take some uh, you know, some elbow grease, uh, and, and that's what we're seeing right now, a slow, deliberate attack uh, that's um, very deadly. It's deadly to the Ukrainians. Yeah. And it's deadly to the Russians. Let's stop pretending that Russia's winning a one-sided uh, fight here. This is a slugfest. This is two heavyweights going at it. Uh, they're they're into the, the late rounds. They're tired. They're banging each other out. One has the advantage. But the, if he makes a mistake, the other side can still hit, can still hurt. And it helps the other side that uh, when they go into the corner, um, they get billions of dollars of infusion of fresh energy. Uh, in the form of Western military aid, um, whereas the other side sort of stuck with what it brought to the fight. Uh, but Russia is still winning. It's deliberate. Right. You know. so, some of the more heavy duty military aid the, for which Zelensky asked and for which Biden said no, and then he changed his mind and said yes. What is it? Has it arrived? And once it does, can it change the uh, military situation on the ground? The, the primary um, military assistance that Ukraine needs is artillery. Uh, this, this is an artillery war. Um, Ukraine started the war with thousands of tubes of artillery. Uh, Russia has destroyed most of those. Uh, Russia started with thousands of tubes of their own artillery. Ukraine has destroyed some of those. Um, but the, 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 the key aid that's being brought, the one that Ukraine needs more than anything, is artillery. And so far, they've received around 300 uh, tubes of artillery. Some of it advanced, like the U.S. M777A2 howitzer, uh, the French Caesar howitzer, uh, Norwegian modifications of our own M109 Paladin howitzer. Um, it's and, and it's not just receiving the howitzers. The Ukrainians were taken out of the country to be trained on, for instance, on the Caesar howitzer. They spent weeks in southern France at the French military facilities being trained on how to use that howitzer. Uh, the United States took them to Grafenwur, the uh, major uh, U.S. Uh, live fire range in Germany, and spent weeks training them there. Uh, others are being trained in Poland. Um, and so they get well-trained, they get well-equipped, and then they come in. Some of the stuff's being interdicted. The Russians are trying. They're, they're blowing up warehouses. They're hitting trains. But most of it's making it to the front. All right, let me stop and, you. When you, yeah. when you say these howitzers are advanced, what do you mean? Do you mean they can hit Russia? They can hit the other side of the border? as well as hitting Russian troops in Ukraine? Well, they, they're advanced in terms of they have significant range. 
Uh, so if you brought them close enough to the Russian border, you could you reach out. But the big advantage, for instance, the M777 uh, A2 um, fires a round called the Excalibur round, 155 millimeters. Uh, it's GPS guided. GPS guided. That means that the United States provides Ukraine real time with the satellite, the GPS coordinates of the location of a Russian command post, real time. Meaning we just saw them; they're there. That information is sent directly to, or maybe with one or two stops, to the artillery unit, which plugs in the coordinates, fires the shell, and a few seconds later, death and destruction is brought to bear on the Russian command post. This isn't hypothetical. It's happening as we speak. So there is an impact. This is causing harm. It's not going to change the outcome of the battle. But they're hitting Russia. They're hurting Russia. Russia's hitting them and hurting them more. But this is the fight that everybody thought it was going to be. You uh, told us uh, several times, and this is six, seven, eight, nine, ten weeks ago, uh, that Russia would win, Ukraine would lose, yep. the military equipment and the money that we're pouring in causes nothing but death and destruction in Ukraine and, and death and destruction amongst the Russian military. Do you still feel that way, or do you see a stalemate, or do you see a pushback, or do you see Putin collapsing? because of a, of a loss of domestic support. I, at this juncture, I don't see Putin collapsing. I still see him firmly in charge uh, with, with serious support. But I'll, I'll caveat this. The Russian people support Putin so long as Putin is committed to victory. Uh, we can no longer speculate, are the Russian people willing to accept losses? They've, they've suffered losses. Okay. There's what Russian would, others. What would victory be for Putin? He already well, he, has the East, but he's destroyed it. He basically captured a, a, a wasteland. Isn't that so, Scott? Well, they've, there's been a lot of destruction. I will say this. Uh, the Western media will never cover this, but the Russian military does its best to minimize damage to the civilian infrastructure. And as soon as they capture an area, you have a, a Ministry of Emergency Services and Reconstruction come in and they start rebuilding because it's the Russian goal to get Donetsk back up on its feet. Uh, fully functional as soon as possible. So there is a lot of destruction. Um, one of the reasons is that the Ukrainians opt to uh, defend, you know, in industrial zones, uh, in residential zones. So there's going to be destruction. But the Russians are, um, they, they do keep in their mind the fact that there's going to be the day after. Okay. And what's what, the what will it take the day of or the day after, Scott? For Putin to get on national television and say we won and to say it so that it is believable. Well, here's the interesting thing, because had you asked me this question two days ago, I would have said um, denazification means absolute total denazification of, of Ukraine. Uh, demilitarization means the total destruction of the Ukrainian military and every piece of NATO equipment there. But yesterday, Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister, when answering a question from uh, the media, the Russian, the, the Russian, foreign, foreign, Russian, foreign. Russian foreign minister, a heavy hitter, a heavy hitter who doesn't speak idly, uh, when asked about Russian objectives, said that Russia will seek denazification, that the, the, the objective of Russia is denazification of eastern Ukraine. You see what I just did there? Eastern Ukraine. That's the first time the Russians have ever put a caveat or a modifier on denazification. Okay, so uh, we all know what the word denazification means. But what is he talking about denazifying? The local police, the federal police, the military, the cultural attitude of the people that live there? Who, who are the Nazis? We say that with a capital N, I assume, that the yeah. Russians claim they want to and can get rid of. Well, first of all, anybody who is um, a member of or a supporter of uh, the various um, neo-Nazi military formations, Azov Regiment, Kraken Battalion, uh, other other units of that nature, um, the political parties, the the far right wing political parties, um, you know, Sloboda and, uh, and and right sector and things of that. Those those are uh, in in Kharkov, and, and it's interesting you said Eastern Ukraine because uh, Kharkov, of course, is the um, birthplace of the Azov Regiment. Um, the Kharkov soccer soccer club is a far right neo Nazi organization. Are these are these militias and regiments, as you call them? I assume that's. And interchangeable those phrase those words, are they under the control of uh, President Zelensky and the senior military people 
uh, in the Ukraine government, or do they act independently of the senior military people in the Ukraine government? Let's put it this way. They take suggestions from Zelensky and from the senior Ukrainian military, but they fight on their terms. Um, they, they, um, you know, they opted into this battle. They started the fight in Donbass. Uh, they are committed to this fight in Donbass. Um, they view any retreat as uh, being sacrilegious. Uh, they resent um, defeatism from uh, from Zelensky, et cetera. So they'll take a suggestion, and, and they're not stupid. I mean, if they have a Ukrainian army unit on their uh, left flank and right flank, um, and they're told they have to withdraw, uh, or else they'll be isolated and destroyed, they'll withdraw. But they'll be they'll let their resentment be known to uh, to the to the leadership. These are not compliant Nazis. These are Nazis who. Um, you call their own shots. And right now, why, even why, do you, why do you call them Nazis? I mean, do, are, are they Nazis in the literal sense uh, about their, their belief in racial superiority and the inferiority of the Jewish people? Or are they just hard right politicos? No, these are these are Nazis in the in the worst sense in the world. Um, these are Ukrainian nationalists who believe that Ukraine is a Aryan race, a, 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 a superior race. They view the Russians, they call them orcs. They view them as subhuman. They view Poles as subhuman. And this isn't just a political belief. Uh, in their resistance, the, the, the resistance of the Bandera movement against uh, Soviet authority from 1944 to 1953, uh, they killed over 150,000 Poles in Western Ukraine. They killed 200,000 Russians. Uh, because they view them what, as subhuman. What time, period, what time period in history are you talking about here? 1944 to 1953. Okay, so the people we're talking about now are two generations later. Right, and they well, worship the people. Later. They worship the people that carried out these crimes. They call Stepan Bandera a national hero. Uh, they put statues up to him. They tattoo okay. their bodies with the symbols of, uh, of of this organization. They hold parades in their honor. So, so does Putin want the land? which he's now destroyed, or does he want to destroy this political, ideological Nazi culture? And if the answer is the latter, what does he care that's in Ukraine? Well, we'll start with what, what does he want? Um, Putin cares about the Russian people. That's his number one priority. Uh, whether you live in Russia or you live elsewhere, uh, he has said, if you remember, he gave a, uh, a statement that's been misquoted often, um, that the greatest... Um, geopolitical tragedy of, uh, of the last century was the collapse of the Soviet Union. And everybody stops right there and says, ah, Putin's an old Soviet hand. He wants the Soviet Union back. No, he doesn't. Because the next part, because overnight, tens of millions of Russians were made homeless, homeless with no pension, no care, nothing. They were abandoned. And I, he said, as the president of all Russia, all Russians will never abandon them. So when we speak of Ukraine, we're speaking of Eastern Ukraine. This is an area that's dominated by ethnic Russians. And right now, as we speak, Zelensky has passed laws banning the Russian language, banning Russian culture, um, basically turning the Russians into subhumans. It's a Nazi policy, and uh, that's not going to stand. So Putin is going to secure the future of these Russians, and the way to do that is bring the territory in which they live under Russian government control. So it's is, not just is, the is it Is it uh, within his plan to utterly destroy the territory he wants? to alienate the 44 million people that live uh, in the whole country and to expect to acquire that land peacefully? Doesn't he know these Nazis, as you call them, will be firing back at him till the end of time or until the last one of them is standing? Well, this is an existential struggle. First of all, he's not trying to destroy the land. The land's being destroyed as an inevitable outcome of combat. He gave the Ukrainians the option to take the easy way out. They opted out. They got, they decided to fight. So now there's a fight. But the Russians, remember, the land he's taking is land that is populated primarily by ethnic Russians. So why destroy the land that you're trying to uh, preserve for the Russians you're trying to defend? Okay, uh, so what is, the, what is the condition of eastern Ukraine today? <coughs> cities are leveled and wheat fields are destroyed. Fair? No, not not necessarily fair. Some cities are destroyed. Some towns are destroyed. Some wheat fields have been shelled. But, um, you know, it's all salvageable. And indeed, the Russians are pursuing a campaign in totality, meaning it goes beyond the battlefield. As they capture lands, they have emergency services coming in from behind, beginning the immediate task of 
Uh, for instance, you have Russian engineers who are removing all the mines and unexpended audience from the fields because now is sowing time. They need the farmers to go out and sow their crops. Farmers can't do that if they're going to get blown up. So Russian engineers right now are rapidly seeking to demine uh, fields. In the cities, you have Russian engineers um, and, and, and businessmen coming in to rebuild the factories, uh, the industrial facilities to get it back up and running so there can be full employment for the Russian-speaking population. Of is, this, is this using money from the Russian government, from the Russian treasury, or are these Russian entrepreneurs investing money in, like, take that steel mill, which they destroyed, in rebuilding something like that? Who's paying for it? Russian government paying for it, the Ministry of Emergency Services. At some point in time, uh, I would imagine that there will be a transition to um, to an um, entrepreneur who's going to run it as a profit-making business. I mean, that's just the way of the world. But right now, this is a Russian government policy using funds allocated to the emergency ministries to rebuild uh, the, the areas of Ukraine that are being occupied. And Russia doesn't call them occupied anymore. Russia says they belong to us. It's all going to belong to us. So uh, let's look at this from a slightly different uh, perspective. I read two interesting pieces this morning, one in the Wall Street Journal and one in Time Magazine, and you, you probably you probably saw them. One saying, this could very well be Vladimir Putin's Vietnam. And one way to look at that is, it'll destroy him, like it destroyed the presidency of, of Lyndon Johnson during Vietnam. The other way to look at it is, it'll keep him in the presidency as long as he wants to stay because he'll just keep promising and delivering part of those promises and fighting and taking a little bit more territory here and a little bit more territory there. How do you feel? What are your comments on either of those two views from the Putin side? Well, I would uh, uh, you know, um, say just on the first blush that the people who wrote it are not Russian experts. They don't know anything about Vladimir Putin. They don't know anything about how Russia is governed. They don't know anything. Uh, this is pure Western-oriented propaganda. Um, I'm safe to say that. They want to debate me anytime. Uh, it's a standard offer. Um, because... Nobody in these articles, nobody's in these articles attacked you. They no, just no, no. It's worked up some ideas in yeah, my it's brain, not... knowing that I'm... you and I were going to be discussing this today. No, and I don't. I don't take it personally. I don't. Even if they attack me, I don't care. I don't take it personally. I don't know them. Um, but what I can say is that they are part and parcel of the um, a a a. a climate of ignorance that exists in the United States about Russia and about Russia's leadership. Um, first of all, if you study the American history uh, in our involvement in Vietnam, you, you'll see that we stumbled into that. It was an accidental war. It wasn't done on purpose. Um, and we had no exit strategy going in. We didn't have a strategy going in at all. Um, that's just the opposite of what, what Russia has done here. Uh, Russia has made a deliberate decision with clearly defined objectives about what it wants to accomplish in Ukraine, and it's accomplishing them. Um, so this is not Vietnam. You can never call it Vietnam. It's not Afghanistan. It's not anything. It's Ukraine, and Russia's doing what Russia wants to do. Two, um, Vladimir Putin has never been about using conflict to sustain his political power. Uh, what makes Vladimir Putin a viable Russian president is the opposite economic stability. He's all about economic stability, about political stability, about stability in general. The last thing he wants is this war. Literally, it's the last thing he wants. Uh, and the way he's going to stay in power is to get out of this war as soon as possible and get back on the track of building the Russian economy. Remember, he inherited an economy that was devastated by the years of Yeltsin, by years of American interference, American malfeasance. And he's been struggling to rebuild Russia's economy since then. And he's done one darn good job. How uh, stable is the Zelensky government? And what opposition, if any, does Zelensky have domestically? I don't mean from the Russians. I mean from uh, uh, politicians in, in Ukraine that don't like him. Are they all united behind him or does he have a domestic opposition? Before this war started, Zelensky went from 78% support to 23% support. This is before the war. Uh, in order to stay in power, he had to ban all opposition parties. That means people who are politically opposed to them. He banned them. He outlawed uh, any opposition media. Um, if we were in Ukraine and we were speaking out against him, he would have banned you. He would have banned me. Um, that's before the war. Once the war started, he now has declared martial law. He has banned all political parties except the neo-Nazi parties, far right. 
which means his government is de facto a Nazi government. That's is what he, it is. is he a member of the neo-Nazi parties? I mean, stated differently, is Vladimir Zelensky a Nazi? No. Vladimir Zelensky is a weak political leader who sold his soul to the devil um, because he got involved in something that uh, was well beyond his pay grade. Uh, he got involved in a war he doesn't understand. Uh, he got involved in domestic politics he can't control. And, um, you know, he he took the path of least resistance. And in this case, it meant embracing the Nazis, bringing them in close. And they're the ones calling the shots today. If you think Zelensky's in charge, you're wrong. Zelensky is basically the mouthpiece of the far right. All right. So 